Good morning, Jubilee. Welcome to worship today. 
To those of you in the sanctuary, thank you for being here. To those of you who are watching on Zoom, God bless you. We're glad that you're joining us for worship. And if you're listening to the recording, uh, thanks for uh, being part of worship at Jubilee. Please pray with me our opening prayer. Dear God, our friend, we come to worship you today. We come to sing, pray, and listen. You always hear us. Help us to hear you. Amen. I hope that you enjoy our opening hymn. This is a um, version of A Mighty Fortress is our God.
The theme of today's service is entrusted, and we're going to explore together the parable of the talents that Jesus told in Matthew 25 and think about what it is that God's given us and what we are doing with those gifts. For a call to worship, I'd like to read a passage from First Chronicles. Um, this was David's prayer of King David um, when all of the people were giving to the building of the temple. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. O Lord, you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and give strength to all. And now, O oh God, and now our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to make this free will offering? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Amen. Everything that we have and everything we give is a gift from God. We think of this as we give our gifts, whether you give online or you uh, mail a check or you drop it in the jar in the back of the sanctuary, we give our gifts. And uh, as a prayer for our offering today, I'd like to sing um, this simple haunting melody. It's an Indian, a tune from India uh, on the theme of Everything we have is a gift from God, and we only give back to God what is God's already. I tend mine possessions, Lord, I offer unto thee. All these were thine, Lord, thou didst give them all to me. Humbly, wondrous are thy doings unto me. Plants and my thoughts and everything I ever do are dependent on thy will and love alone. I commit my spirit unto thee. I tend mine possessions, Lord, I offer unto thee. Thou art the way, the truth, thou art the life. Sinful, I commit myself to thee. Jesus Christ is feeling all the heart of me. He can give me victory or all that threatens me. Jesus Christ is filling all my heart. If you have a um, prayer request you'd like to share today, uh, you're welcome to share it in a few moments when uh, Duane comes around with the mic, or you can also text your prayer request to Duane today if you're watching on Zoom. Um, you can find the order of worship in the bulletin in front of you in the pews. You're welcome to those, or uh, you'll see that Joel has projected that our worship song will be uh, Shout to the Lord. In a few moments, we will pray together, and then we're excited that this, this morning we'll have a special blessing uh, for Calvin Grable and his family. Sharon DeFore has selected a story for us, and Joel will 
present that um, video and Suzanne Opal will read the scripture and then Joel will preach uh, from Matthew 25 on the theme entrusted. Our response song will be take my life and let it be a song of consecration and offering. And then there'll be an opportunity for you to share a response or an announcement followed by the benediction and our recessional hymn. I hope that you uh, can worship along, even if you're not singing, with Shout to the Lord.
What have you brought to share with your church family this morning? Uh, Dwayne will bring the mic your way. If you'd like to share, just raise your hand, leave your mask on, and he'll extend the mic uh, to you if you have something that you would like to share. Yes, Chris. I just want to say uh, thank you this morning for letting me, letting me be in tennis and you know just just receive the news. I just I just pray for everybody here and I ask that you continue to help pray for me and my family. And like I say, I just say thank you. All. It's wonderful to have you here, and we will continue to pray for you and, and for your family. Thank you, Chris. Valerie Foy asks for prayers for our neighbors. Um, uh, one of our neighbors, Tony Dockery, passed away this week. I believe his funeral was yesterday. And we're going to pray for Tony's family and friends. Uh, we also pray for the family of Laura Medina. Laura's husband, Miguel, uh, died. Uh, this past week. We're praying for um, Laura's sons and for Laura. Wayne Garrow asks for prayer. He is leaving for Oklahoma for a training uh, tomorrow for his work. And he said, uh, please pray for me. He said, the county where I'm going is averaging 100 new COVID-19 cases daily. And he's, um, he's hoping to be safe while he's there. Regina Martinez asks for prayer for her son, uh, Jorge, who is ill. Uh, she also asks that we pray for our friend, Marion Searles. Uh, not sure how many of you remember Miss Marion from her work with the Methodists and in, all over this community when she lived here. Uh, Marion is um, giving a kidney to someone this week, and this week also someone else is donating a kidney to Miss Marion's son-in-law, Blake. And so they're both having kidney either transplant or removal surgeries this week. So we're going to pray for the Searles family as they go through all of that. We're praying for Lisa Shelley, um, who is recovering from COVID-19. And Lisa asks that we continue to hold up to God all those affected by COVID. Lord, have mercy on us all. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone else who has something to share? Let's pray. Oh, yes, Miss Maxine, I'm sorry, I missed your hand. Thank you. Yes, Miss Maxine. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I just want to give praise and honor to the Lord this morning. Amen. I just thank you, praise God, for honor to be able to come out and worship in God's house. Even though I'm not at my church, but I still thank and praise God. Well, let me be able to come out and I just like for you to you all to pray for me and pray for my family and also uh Kathy oldest son uh had a friend and his son shot himself and a young a young guy and I would just ask y'all to pray for him that the Lord will keep the dad and mother you know with strength build up in the Lord Thank you. Thank you, Miss Maxine. And thank you for reminding us what a blessing it is just to be here today. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. Anyone else? Let's pray together. Oh, God, we are so grateful that we can gather in this way today. Thank you. Thank you for meeting us here, 
for being with us in every situation and circumstance, being our mighty fortress. We uh, throw ourselves on you, O oh God, and we give thanks for your strength and your presence and the hope that your spirit gives us. So many people are grieving today, O oh God. We ask your mercy for those who grieve. So many are sick today, O oh God. We ask for your mercy for us all. We pray for those who are affected and impacted in so many ways um, by COVID, and we ask for patience and resilience and strength of spirit to uh, press on through these difficult days. Watch over and protect those that we love. Especially we ask for the Searles family, for those that are quarantined, for those who are afraid. We ask for your mercy for us all. Receive our gratitude, O oh God, for your sustaining presence. For the strength that comes from being part of a worshiping community. And for the beauty of your touch in this world. For all your mercies and grace, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, we're excited to have a um, special blessing for Calvin Grable, uh, for big boy Calvin. We are so grateful to be part of that service. You know, Jesus, as Dwayne always reminds us in the window in the back, bless the children. And it is a special joy for he and I any time that we can bless children here at Jubilee. We bless children and pray for the day when they will make their own confession uh, of faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized at that time. And those of you who, like Dwayne and I, have been here for a long time, know the power of the uh, strength of the church and the family and God being combined to strengthen a child's life. And we are so grateful that the Grable family is part of Jubilee. Yes, we are gonna be blessing the little boy that's laying in the center aisle, sprawled out. <laughs> well, we welcome all children, don't we? We welcome you, Kelvin to be dedicated this morning. And these services are important to us. Um, if you have older children that have never been dedicated, uh, feel free to um, talk to us about dedicating your whole family or whatever. Uh, I'd like to invite Matt and Beth and Kelvin to come forward. Kelvin, it won't be that bad, okay? I promise. E Elaine will not lift you up high anymore. <laughs> Y'all are welcome to share. Well, like Dwayne said, you're not too old to get dedicated. Calvin's waited the longest, I guess. Uh, it was not intentional by us. Um, but he's made it clear this morning and uh, every day of his life that he's his own man and he needs his own dedication and that his uh, sisters and brother, theirs doesn't cover him. Um, so we're thankful for Jubilee and we're also grateful for our parents, our siblings and extended family who also support us in the raising of our children. And thank you to you all who have helped us um, raise all the, the rest of these kids as well. So we're grateful to God and to our church family. And we have a, a couple of questions uh, for Matt and Beth. 
Do you accept Calvin as a gift from God? Do you dedicate yourselves to lead Calvin in God's ways, preparing him to make his own decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord? Do you promise to gladly surrender him to the ministry God has in mind for him, even if it might mean going to the ends of the earth? I have a question for the congregation. Do you accept your responsibility for Kelvin's well-being? Will you, by prayer, example, and words, support Matt and Beth in nurturing him to respond to the grace and truth of Jesus Christ? Thank you. Matt and Beth, here's a blessing for you all. We believe that Calvin will grow to, into a solid human being. And we pray that God will give you all the wisdom to know when to set boundaries and when to give him freedom on that way. We believe that Calvin will become a strong man of faith. And we pray that God will give you the strength to be a faithful witness to him. We believe that Calvin will grow to be a man with who is confident of his place in the world. And we pray that God will give you eyes to see his talents and gifts and strengths. And we believe that he will grow knowing that he is loved and treasured. And we pray that God will give you opportunities to create joyful memories. God bless you guys. And Kelvin, I'd like to pray a special blessing on you this morning. May God bless you, and may you find a real friend in God, and may you walk with God throughout your life. May God be with you. Amen. Joel is going to um, project a um, response that all of us can share with the Grable family and Calvin this morning. And so um, if you would uh, join me. Calvin, you are new to us, but you are not new to God. For all eternity, God has known your name. Now, so do we. We welcome you as part of the Grable family, and we love you as part of our congregation. May you grow in wisdom and knowledge and love of God. Amen. Thank you, Calvin. We got your back. Or maybe I should say Beth does. <laughs> this morning, um, our children's story is going to be on the theme of Matthew 25. So I hope all of you kids and all you grownups are listening for that. But first, uh, the Jesus Loves Me song.
Once there was a wealthy man preparing to leave on a long journey. He gathered his servants together and gave careful instructions on what to do while he was away. I will be leaving you shortly and may not return for quite some time, he explained to them. I am putting you in charge of my wealth so that my estate will continue to prosper even while I am away. So the master divided his wealth among his servants based on each one's ability to manage it. The first servant was given five talents. Each talent was equal to thousands of dollars. This servant took the sum of money given to him and he immediately went to work using what he was given to make more money. He knew this would please the master. His efforts produced five more talents. The second servant was given two talents. Not as much as was given the first servant, but still a great deal of money. This servant took what was given to him and, like the first servant, dutifully invested it to make more money. He too knew this would please the master. His efforts produced two more talents. The third servant was given one talent, less than the other servants, but still a good amount of money. This servant failed to see the value in the opportunity that the master had given him and fearing any risk to it, promptly went out and dug a hole and buried it in the ground. Many days, weeks, and months passed, and finally the master returned. Eager to find out the condition of his property and wealth, he called his servants together to hear what they had done with what he had given them to manage. Each servant approached the master to give their report. The first two servants proudly showed their master that they had doubled what he had given them. The master smiled. Well done, my good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with a few things. I will now put you in charge of many things. He added, come and let us celebrate. Then the last servant, who had been trusted with one talent, approached the master and accused him saying, you are a hard man to please, so in fear of you, I buried the money you gave me into the ground. Here is the one talent that belongs to you. The master was furious. You wicked and lazy servant, he said. I gave you an amount of property I knew you would be able to manage, but you did nothing with it. At least you could have put it in the bank to earn a small amount of interest. Now you will lose your talent to the servant who gained five. With that, the master took the only talent the servant had and cast him out of his household forever. Suzanne Opal will come and read our scripture text today. And following that, we'll look forward to your message, Joel. This is Matthew 14, or Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. So the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then 
The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will speak to your people this morning, to myself and to, to those gathered here in person, those on Zoom, and those who will watch the recording later. Pray that you will encourage, edify, and challenge our hearts this morning, God. Amen. This may well be the easiest sermon I've ever prepared. Jesus sums up this parable so nicely in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, when he says, For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So clearly, God is pleased with everyone who is rich. He wants them to get richer. And those of us who aren't rich are just out of luck. Can I get an amen? No, I'm just kidding. Maybe I'm taking that verse slightly out of context or removing it from its context altogether. To be clear, that's not at all what I think Jesus' message in this parable is. But it raises an interesting question for me. Why did, Jesus speak, why did Jesus choose to speak in parables that are often cryptic, hard to understand? Well, we as people living 2,000 years after these stories were originally told, we need to be mindful of Jesus' cultural context. First and foremost, he was a Jewish man from the Mideast living under Roman occupation. He was speaking to and teaching primarily Jewish people along with anyone else who would listen. The settings and some of the details of Jesus' parables probably would have made more sense to those listening initially, since he was referencing objects or ideas that were part of their daily lives. That being said, it still seems that the meaning of the parables was often mysterious to the ears of those who originally heard them, just as they are to us. We get a glimpse of this earlier in the book of Matthew in chapter 13, verse 10, when the disciples directly ask Jesus why he speaks to the people in parables. Jesus replies in Matthew 13, verse 11, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even that will be taken away from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Now, I imagine the disciple who asked Jesus that question, I imagine him responding with a bit of a forced smile. Okay, 
Thanks for clearing that up, Jesus. I have a couple of theories as to what Jesus is getting at in terms of parables. Life is complex, and sometimes stories are the best way to communicate abstract or difficult to understand ideas, like the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is illustrating with this parable. I think it's also important to note that Jesus was likely teaching a crowd of people with different backgrounds and varying degrees of education. Telling a story gives, gives each listener the opportunity to receive the message as it relates to their own context. With that in mind, I think it's important to note that Jesus' message of hope and healing for the world is accessible for all, regardless of mental ability or your level of education. The good news or the gospel message is both wonderfully simple and impossibly deep. It's simple enough to be summarized in one verse, like John 3.16, while also containing enough depth to fascinate scholars for a lifetime. The second purpose that I theorize motivates Jesus' use of parables is I think Jesus is attempting to reach those who desire truth and are willing to look past their own pride or preconceived notions to seek, ask questions, and explore the message that's revealed to us in the text. I believe he desires for us to wrestle with the difficulties and complexities of life that he's trying to convey through these parables. I believe he encourages us to seek the truth of scripture with diligence and persistence. I want to thank the youth group for letting me share some of my thoughts on this parable during a devotional I led at the youth event this past Wednesday evening. The youth and sponsors asked great questions and provided good input. Suzanne Opal, at one point, made the distinction that though she agrees God does desire for us to wrestle with difficult concepts in scripture, she doesn't feel like he's playing hard to get or just intentionally making things difficult. I think that's important to keep in mind. God desires for us to seek him, not just so that he can see us sweat, but so that we can come to a more full and complete understanding of who he is and who he is calling us to be as his people. This is not from scripture, but as I've often heard from a variety of different sources, anything that's worth doing probably isn't easy. In summary, let's resist the temptation to live solely on spiritual snippets or thoughts and ideas from others. While God does speak to us through our spiritual community, and while that's a vital part of our spiritual lives, to hear others' input and perspectives, I believe God also desires to speak directly to each one of us through parables such as this. So let's roll up our sleeves and embrace the challenge of wrestling with passages such as this so that the Holy Spirit can speak and reveal God's truth to his people. As the youth, the youth sponsors and I looked at this parable on Wednesday evening, there were a lot of questions that arose concerning what or who each character in the parable represented. And Chris Bowers provided some insight that I found very helpful. Now I got Chris permission to share this, but I didn't get a correct a direct quote. So I'm going to paraphrase. Chris can straighten me out later if I get it wrong. But anyway, his main point, as I understood it, was that we should try to focus on the big picture of the idea behind the parable rather than getting bogged down on details such as what each character or object in the parable represents. One thing I keep coming back to is that Jesus' parables were fictional stories with fictional characters. I think the point of the story is more important than any one character or point of symbolism within it. So what is the message that Jesus is conveying to us through this parable in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30? Well, I think there could be multiple messages, depending on the listener and what the Holy Spirit chooses to reveal to the listener at any given time. 
Maybe that's another reason why some parables seem to have multiple possible interpretations. Because Jesus knew that the message would be received differently by different people at different times. Maybe the parables were intended to be multifaceted or have layers of meaning for that exact reason. All that to say, you may well end up with a completely diff- at a completely different place than I do concerning this parable. And I don't think we should be surprised by that. What is the Holy Spirit teaching you about God and his call on your life through this parable? I invite each of us to wrestle with this passage in the coming days and seek the truth that Jesus wants you to understand. So what about the parable itself? Well, you may have noticed it follows the parable that Dwayne preached on last Sunday that is also on the topic of the kingdom of heaven. Now, depending on the translation of the Bible that you're reading, Matthew 25, 14 through 30 may be titled either the parable of the talents or the parable of the bags of gold. Another similar parable is recorded in Luke chapter 19, but there doesn't seem to be consensus from scholars on whether these are the same parable recorded slightly differently or whether Jesus told similar parables at different times. Either way, it's important to know that the talent referenced in Matthew chapter 25 refers to a sum of money that was determined according to weight. An interesting fact I found at uh, blueletterbible.org, apparently at that time, a talent of silver in Israel weighed about 100 pounds, and a talent of gold in Israel weighed about 200 pounds. So we're talking about considerable amounts of money. So I think the premise of the parable seems pretty simple. The master of a house or estate goes on a long journey and he entrusts different servants with different sums of money in his absence. When he returns, two of the servants have doubled the money they were originally given while the remaining servant returns precisely the amount he was given because he literally buried it underground. The master is pleased with the servants that doubled what they were given, but he's very upset with the servant that buried the money to the point that he had that, that he, that he had the money given to the servant that was originally given five talents. Well, I'll just cut to the chase regarding the main idea. And then I'd like to circle back and discuss some of the finer points that have jumped out at me. As I was studying this passage, the main idea that God put on my heart was the importance of mutual trust between us and God. I think the sums of money in the parable represent any number of things that God entrusts to us. Money or other financial assets, abilities, knowledge, wisdom, experience, as well as spiritual gifts that God gives us such as love, joy, peace, grace, joy, and mercy. said joy twice. It's that important. Everything that I have has been entrusted to me by God. But am I entrusting God with those things that he's entrusted to me? What I mean by that is, do I treat the things that God has given me as if they are his? Do I share openly of all that I have? Do I share openly for God's glory and the benefit of others, or do I just try to play it safe? Another way of thinking about it is, is the Worldwide Church, capital C, are we as the Worldwide Church faithfully representing Jesus to the world? How about the church in America? How about the church in Mississippi? The church in Meridian? How about Jubilee? Are we faithfully representing Jesus? What role have you and I been playing in that, good or bad? Are we reinvesting what God has invested in each of us or burying it underground out of fear and anxiety? I think it's an important question to ask for all that God has entrusted to us. 
At the end of the day, regardless of what I have or don't have, I believe the key thing that I have to acknowledge is that God is ultimately trusting me to trust him with everything that I have. When I don't return God's trust, I'm making the decision to bet on myself. And that's a truly dangerous place to be. Trusting God may lead me into some situations or circumstances that feel risky. And I don't just mean physical risk. I mean risk of social or cultural rejection. We may not always be able to meet people's expectations, especially if those expectations run counter to God's. Forgiveness is risky. It is relinquishing the ability to hold wrongdoing over the perpetrator's head with no guarantee that they will express remorse or change moving forward. Relationships of any kind are risky, especially with someone who's different than me. There are so many opportunities for conflict, pain, and misunderstanding in relationships. But all of this pales in comparison to the risk I assume when I opt for my strength and my understanding over God's. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. God forbid that I allow fear to skew my perspective to the point that I place my trust in myself because that ultimately leads to separation from God and the weeping and gnashing of teeth that Jesus references in verse 30 of chapter 25. As humans, we have an instinct for self-preservation or the desire to protect ourselves. We were designed that way by God to prevent us from making bad decisions that would put ourselves or others in needless danger. But God has also given us the ability to trust in him, even when it may seem risky. But what do we actually have to lose if we're trusting in God? After all, this parable was told by a man with power over death itself. Now to be clear, our confidence in God's providence and provision for us doesn't mean we should just throw caution to the wind and jump off buildings expecting God to save us. Trust in God shouldn't lead to reckless behavior or decision-making, rather obedience as God leads us and guides us. As I mentioned previously, I'd like to close by mentioning a couple of the finer points of this parable that jumped out at me as I've meditated and studied this passage over the past couple of weeks. The first is from verses 24 and 25, when the servant who buried the money is explaining his actions to the master. Those verses read, starting in 24, then the man who had, experienced, who, had, who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. So here, see, here's what belongs to you. I think the servant's response here says much more about the servant than the master. Even if the master was strict with very high, maybe even unreasonable expectations, the servant makes it clear that they were motivated by fear, not by doing right by the master. The servant acts as if they did the will of the master by burying the money, while the master understands that the servant's actions were ultimately selfish and therefore fruitless. Far be it from me to use what God has entrusted to me to serve my purposes rather than his. Fear is a powerful motivator, but God's love is stronger. May God's love consistently triumph over fear as the motivator in our lives. Finally, what do we make of verse 29 that I read at the outset? I'll read it again. For whoever has will be given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. 
I keep coming back to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. I don't think verse 29 of chapter 25 is about financial wealth or intellect or physical ability or health or anything else that's externally measurable. I think it has to do with the heart. I think this is purely about trust and faith. In whose hands do we entrust our hearts and our lives? God's or our own? If all we are is entrusted to God, then we only stand to gain. On the other hand, if all we are is entrusted to ourselves, then we will ultimately lose it all. That being said, I think it's a mistake to focus on external results. I don't think the amounts of gold or how much gold the servants gained is really that important. It doesn't matter if I'm the servant with five talents or two talents. I cannot earn God's love or the salvation that he offers to me through Jesus. They are freely given. I believe my call is simply to trust God and respond with obedience as he leads me to manage and share what he has entrusted to me. God will take care of the results. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the
Thank you for that. Thank you for that message, Joel. Um, a quote that came to mind as you were preaching uh, is from Jim Elliott. Uh, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Uh, and you'll remember that Jim Elliott it was a missionary in Ecuador who um, was killed in his attempts to share the gospel. Thank you for your message. Maybe you have something that you want to share in response to today's service. Dwayne will uh, be happy to bring the mic your way. Just raise your hand if you have something you'd like to share. Uh, you'll see um, Joel is uh, sharing the announcements. Yes, Sister Deweese. I just thank God for a praise report um, on uh, a doctor visit I had with. Um, the blood clot gets in the right lung. It's not fully dissolved, but it's dissolving. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So but it's dissolving. I just want to give Amen. God all the praise. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Deweese uh, shares that the blood clot in her lung is dissolving, and we give God thanks for that. Amen. Anyone else have something to share? Joel Diener has an announcement. You'll see on, on the announcements, uh, there'll be a youth event on Wednesday, prayer breakfast on Friday. Yes, Joel. Um, yes. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to reschedule the junior youth event that was scheduled for this evening. Um, and I hope to get with the sponsors in the next couple of days to get a new date on that. So stay tuned, junior youth and parents, for the new date for the junior youth event that was going to be this evening. That will be rescheduled. Also, as Elaine just mentioned, that uh, we will still have a youth event this Wednesday evening. Chris Bowers is hosting it at his house. It'll be from 7 to 8 15 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. For more information about junior youth and youth uh, schedules, check with Joel. I'm looking forward to the service next Sunday. Um, I'll be preaching on the passage that follows the one that Joel preached so that we have three sermons in a row from Matthew 25. So check out the last section of Matthew 25 this week. And if you get an insight, I would love to hear about it. Does anyone else have something that you want to share? Then Jubilee, um, I invite you to um, hear our benediction for this morning. Please pray with me. Gracious God, grant that the words we have heard this day may so be grafted into our hearts that they will bring forth fruit to the honor and praise of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. Cheryl will usher you as the um, recessional song is played. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. Who dwell in dark and sin My hand will save I who made the stars of night I will make their darkness bright